Lynx Hunting. Jimmy lounged about the dining room and watched his mother with large, serious eyes. Suddenly he said, Ma, now can I borrow Pa's gun? She was overcome with the feminine horror which is able to mistake preliminary words for the full accomplishment of the dread thing. Why, Jimmy, she cried, of all wonders, your father's gun? No, indeed you can't. He was fairly well crushed, but he managed to mutter sullenly, Well, Willie Dalzel, he's got a gun. In reality, his heart had previously been beating with such tumult, he had himself been so impressed with the daring and sin of his request, that he was glad that all was over now, and his mother could do very little further harm to his sensibilities. He had been influenced into the venture by the larger boys. Huh! the Dalzel urchin had said. Your father's got a gun, hasn't he? Well, why don't you bring that? Puffing himself, Jimmy had replied, Well, I can if I want to. It was a black lie, but really the Dalzel boy was too outrageous with his eternal bill-posting about the gun which a beaming uncle had entrusted to him. Its possession made him superior in manfulness to most boys in the neighborhood, or at least they enviously conceded him such a position. But he was so overbearing, and stuffed the fact of his treasure so relentlessly down their throats, that on this occasion the miserable Jimmy had lied as naturally as most animals swim. Willie Dalzel had not been checkmated, for he had instantly retorted, "'Why don't you get it, then?' "'Well, I can if I want to.' "'Well, get it, then.' "'Well, I can if I want to.' Thereupon, Jimmy had paced away with great airs of surety as far as the door of his home, where his manner changed to one of tremulous misgiving as it came upon him to address his mother in the dining room. There had happened that which had happened. When Jimmy returned to his two distinguished companions, he was blown out with a singular pomposity. He spoke these noble words. "'Oh, well,' I guess I don't want to take the gun out today. They had been watching him with gleaming ferret eyes, and they detected his falsity at once. They challenged him with shouted jibes, but it was not in the rules for the conduct of boys that one should admit anything whatsoever, and so Jimmy, backed into an ethical corner, lied as stupidly, as desperately, as hopelessly as ever lone savage fights when surrounded at last in his jungle. Such accusations were never known to come to any point, for the reason that the number and kind of denials always equaled or exceeded the number of accusations, and no boy was ever brought really to book for these misdeeds. In the end they went off together, Willie Dalzel with his gun being a trifle in advance, and discoursing upon his various works. They passed along a maple-lined avenue, a highway common to boys bound for that free land of hills and woods in which they lived in some part their romance of the moment, whether it was of Indians, miners, smugglers, soldiers, or outlaws. The paths were their paths, and much was known to them of the secrets of the dark green hemlock thickets the wastes of sweet fern and huckleberry, the cliffs of gaunt bluestone, with the sumac burning red at their feet. Each boy had, I am sure, a conviction that some day the wilderness was to give forth to him a marvellous secret. They felt that the hills and the forests knew much, and they heard a voice of it in the silence. It was vague, thrilling, fearful, and altogether fabulous. The grown folk seemed to regard these wastes merely as so much distance between one place and another place, or as a rabbit cover, or as a district to be judged according to the value of the timber. But to the boys it spoke some great inspiring word, which they knew even as those who pace the shore know the enigmatic speech of the surf. In the meantime they live there, in season, lives of ringing adventure, by dint of imagination. The boys left the avenue, skirted hastily through some private grounds, climbed a fence, and entered the thickets, 
It happened that at school the previous day, Willie Dalzel had been forced to read and acquire in some part a solemn description of a lynx. The meagre information thrust upon him had caused him grimaces of suffering, but now, he said suddenly, I'm going to shoot a lynx. The other boys admired this statement, but they were silent for a time. Finally, Jimmy said meekly, What's a lynx? He had endured his ignorance as long as he was able. The Dalzel boy mocked him. Why, don't you know what a lynx is? A lynx? Why, a lynx is an animal something like a cat, and it's got great big green eyes, and it sits on the limb of a tree and just glares at you. It's a pretty bad animal, I tell you. Why, when I... Huh, said the third boy. Where do you ever see a lynx? Oh, I've seen em, plenty of em. I bet you'd be scared if you seen one once. Jimmy and the other boy each demanded, How do you know I would? They penetrated deeper into the wood. They climbed a rocky zigzag path, which led them at times where with their hands they could almost touch the tops of giant pines. The grey cliffs sprang sheer towards the sky. Willie Dalzel babbled about his impossible lynx, and they stalked the mountainside like chamois hunters, although no noise of bird or beast broke the stillness of the hills. Below them, Willemville was spread out somewhat like the cheap green and black lithograph of the time, a bird's-eye view of Willemville, New York. In the end, the boys reached the top of the mountain and scouted off among wild and desolate ridges. They were burning with desire to slay large animals. They thought continually of elephants, lions, tigers, crocodiles. They discoursed upon their immaculate conduct in case such monsters confronted them, and they all lied carefully about their courage. The breeze was heavy with the smell of sweet fern. The pines and hemlocks sighed as they waved their branches. In the hollows the leaves of the laurels were lacquered where the sunlight found them. No matter the weather, it would be impossible to long continue an expedition of this kind without a fire, and presently they built one, snapping down for fuel the brittle underbranches of the pines. About this fire they were willed to conduct a sort of play, the Dalzel boy taking the part of a bandit chief, and the other boys being his trusty lieutenants. They stalked to and fro, long-strided, stern yet devil-may-care, three terrible little figures. Jimmy had an uncle who made game of him whenever he caught him in this kind of play, and often this uncle quoted derisively the following classic, "'Once aboard the lugger, Bill, and the girl is mine. Now to burn the chateau and destroy all evidence of our crime. But hark ye, Bill, no violence!' Wheeling abruptly, he addressed these dramatic words to his comrades. They were impressed. They decided at once to be smugglers, and in the most ribald fashion they talked about carrying off young women. At last they continued their march through the woods. The smuggling motif was now grafted fantastically upon the original lynx idea, which Willie Dalzel refused to abandon at any price. Once they came upon an innocent bird who happened to be looking another way at the time. After a great deal of manoeuvring and big words, Willie Dalzel reared his fowling piece and blew this poor thing into a mere rag of wet feathers, of which he was proud. Afterwards the other big boy had a turn at another bird. Then it was plainly Jimmy's chance. The two others had, of course, some thought of cheating him out of his chance, but of a truth he was timid to explode such a thunderous weapon, and as soon as they detected this fear, they simply overbore him and made it clearly understood that if he refused to shoot, he would lose his cast, his scalp-lock, his girdle, his honour. They had reached the old death-coloured snake fence which marked the limits of the upper pasture of the Fleming farm. Under some hickory trees, the path ran parallel to the fence. Behold, a small priestly chipmunk came to a rail, and folding his hands on his abdomen, addressed them in his own tongue. It was Jimmy's shot. Abjured by the others, he took the gun. His face was stiff with apprehension. The dalzel boy was giving forth fine words. Go ahead! 
Ah, oh, don't be afraid. It's nothing to do. Why, I've done it a million times. Don't shut both your eyes now. Just keep one open and shut the other one. He'll get away if you don't watch out. Now you're all right. Why don't you let her go? Go ahead. Jimmy, with his legs braced apart, was in the center of the path. His back was greatly bent, owing to the mechanics of supporting the heavy gun. His companions were screeching in the rear. There was a wait. Then he pulled the trigger. To him there was a frightful roar. His cheek and his shoulder took a stunning blow. His face felt a hot flush of fire, and opening his two eyes, he found that he was still alive. He was not too dazed to instantly adopt a becoming egotism. It had been the first shot of his life. But, directly after the well-mannered celebration of this victory, a certain cow, which had been grazing in the line of fire, was seen to break wildly across the pasture, bellowing and bucking. The three smugglers and lynx hunters looked at each other out of blanched faces. Jimmy had hit the cow. The first evidence of his comprehension of this fact was in the celerity with which he returned the discharged gun to Willie Dalzell. They turned to flee. The land was black, as if it had been overshadowed suddenly with thick storm clouds, and even as they fled in their horror, a gigantic Swedish farmhand came from the heavens and fell upon them, shrieking in eerie triumph. In a twinkle they were clouted prostrate. The Swede was elate and ferocious in a foreign and fulsome way. He continued to beat them and yell. From the ground they raised their dismal appeal. Oh, please, mister, we didn't do it. He did it. I didn't do it. We didn't do it. We didn't mean to do it. Oh, please, mister. In these moments of childish terror, little lads go half blind and it is possible that few moments of their afterlife made them suffer as they did when the Swede flung them over the fence and marched them towards the farmhouse. They begged like cowards on the scaffold, and each one was for himself. Oh, please let me go, mister. I didn't do it, mister. He did it. Oh, please let me go, mister. The boyish view belongs to boys alone and if this tall and knotted labourer was needlessly without charity, none of the three lads questioned it. Usually, when they were punished, they decided that they deserved it, and the more that they were punished, the more they were convinced that they were criminals of a most subterranean type. As to the hitting of the cow being a pure accident, and therefore not of necessity a criminal matter, such reading never entered their heads. When things happened and they were caught— they commonly paid dire consequences, and they were accustomed to measure the probabilities of woe utterly by the damage done, and not in any way by the culpability. The shooting of the cow was plainly heinous, and undoubtedly their dungeons would be knee-deep in water. "'He did it, mister!' This was a general outcry. Jimmy used it as often as did the others. As for them— it was certain that they had no direct thought of betraying their comrade for their own salvation. They thought themselves guilty because they were caught. When boys were not caught, they might possibly be innocent. But captured boys were guilty. When they cried out that Jimmy was the culprit, it was principally a simple expression of terror. Old Henry Fleming, the owner of the farm, strode across the pasture towards them. He had in his hand a most cruel whip. This whip he flourished. At his approach the boys suffered the agonies of the fire regions, and yet anybody with half an eye could see that the whip in his hand was a mere accident, and that he was a kind old man, when he cared. When he had come near he spoke crisply. "'What you boys been doing to my cow?' The tone had a deep threat in it, they all answered by saying that none of them had shot the cow. Their denials were tearful and clamorous, and they crawled knee by knee. The vision of it was like three martyrs being dragged towards the stake. 
old Fleming stood there, grim, tight-lipped. After a time he said, "'Which boy done it?' There was some confusion, and then Jimmy spake. "'I done it, mister.' Fleming looked at him. Then he asked, "'Well, what did you shoot her for?' Jimmy thought, hesitated, decided, faltered, and then formulated this. "'I thought she was a lynx.' Old Fleming and his Swede at once lay down in the grass and laughed themselves helpless. End of Lynx Hunting